I wanted to get our discussion this morning started talking just a little bit about something that has been um, on a lot of our minds, which is access to mental health care, particularly for immigrants, and some of the very unique challenges that um, immigrants face in getting access to mental health care. We know here in Texas, just from our last panel discussion about just the dearth of resources that are available for people who uh, face mental health issues. And that's for those of us who are citizens who were born here. And those challenges are just compounded when it comes to those who are immigrants and live in mixed families um, and who also many times deal with uh, poverty issues. So I wanted us to get started talking with um, Mr. Martinez, uh, Dr. Martinez a little bit about some of the issues you think we're facing here in Texas in terms of ensuring that immigrants who have mental health issues can just get basic access to care that they need. Well, Brady, I think that, uh, thank you very much and I want to thank the audience for coming today and I want to thank uh, obviously the Texas Trib and Evan Smith for putting this on the agenda. Like you said often, that's, uh, this is not even part of a mental health discussion in a lot of conferences that I go to. I think access is just obviously a tremendous issue for all of us in general. How many of you have tried to, or try to help a loved one even just try to access uh, the mental health system in the state of Texas and how you know, daunting that can be, let alone if you have the, the issue of being an immigrant? And one of the things we have to remember, which I find often in some of the discussions I've, I hear, is folks lump everyone into the immigrant category and then think they're all undocumented. Well, obviously, there's those that are here that are documented are legal immigrants, and then some that are undocumented. And so th those are two different categories, and it really affects them quite a bit in what access to services they have. Obviously, the ones with the greatest challenge for uh, accessing uh, mental health services are the undocumented. And if you think of all the issues of social determinants that affect us all, everything, everything from, and one of the big ones that, it, that affects us all is really what is your income level. So the majority of immigrants, be they documented or undocumented, are usually in low paying jobs, overwhelmingly. And that in and of itself is just a real challenge to the access to care of anyone we do want to achieve that. For instance, take for example the, uh, the thought that if you're really making a low income wage, if you're lucky and you're employed, and the majority of folks that actually are here and are immigrants are overwhelmingly employed, more than 80%. So uh, very few uh, fall in the category of not being employed, and those that do are usually kids. So they're working folks, but what, can you imagine you have to take time off from work, but you're making a low-income wage, so you're, you're, your employer is not providing you know, any kind of health services that benefits that you can access. So there's this opportunity cost that we call it in economics. So it's so great that, in fact, that is a huge barrier in itself, which unfortunately results in that often happens with folks in that category of that, that don't earn a living wage, is that in fact you wait until it becomes a critical issue. And then where do you end up going? Well, the access in your community is very limited. Most likely you end up in an emergency room, which as we well know is a very costly place to have care uh, delivered. And we know that our ERs are very, unfortunately not well prepared even to take care of mental health uh, issues in general, regardless of who walks through the door. But if it's an emergency issue, that's where most folks sort of think about. The other piece, uh, and if you think about uh, the undocumented, the majority of them are actually of uh, ethnic category. In general, if you look at the studies, we prefer to actually then access our parent care doc. But here they are not able to actually do that uh, in a consistent basis or to have a relationship consistently with, with uh, a, a primary care physician. Uh, some of them do, which is kind of great if you go to an FQHC or maybe a community health center or a community health center. Uh, there's uh, immigrant clinics. So there are places that it can be done. But so those, those are just some of the very few issues. Let well, don't know if you start to add in stigma of mental health. Then you start to add in the fact, are we culturally and linguistically competent in the delivery of services, which then really results in, are you actually comfortable in going to that provider to be able to talk about that issue? Or you take into consideration another major issue that's happening for the immigrant population, especially between those that are here legally and those that are maybe naturalized citizens, or even those that are undocumented is the mixed family, where the children are actually US citizens, but maybe the parents are not. And so, that also causes some really other additional factors that I think Dr. Mickerson probably can add to better than I can. Mm. But I would just add, the list is long, mm. and, and I'm not going to you know, go through every one of them, but those are some of the major ones that I know have impacted and are continuing to impact uh, families here in Texas. Continuing to touch on the tip of the iceberg, um, you deal with children on, on a daily basis, and one of the things that... Um, that Dr. Martinez talked a little bit about is cultural competency. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about 
how important that is for your work and what that means for folks who are dealing with um, children in the immigrant community who, who are struggling with mental health issues. Well, and thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to, to participate. It's Cultural competency is a really big problem in the sense that um, we can't lump all kids in just one group. The, the children that come over right, as immigrants, non-documented or documented um, children, their parents don't really, they have a, a difficulty with access right, because of various reasons. One, they don't know how to access the mental health. And two, if there isn't an approach that they understand and they feel comfortable with, they're not going to access mental health. Um, a lot of the primary belief in mental health, and for example, the Hispanic community, is that, is that if your child is misbehaving, right, or is a problem child, it's your fault. And mental health symptoms come along with behavioral changes. And so instead of seeking help, what they're doing is hiding because they don't, they feel that they are going to be called on the responsibility. The other also is that if you're an undocumented parent, it's very scary to take your child to talk to someone and tell them what they've gone through in their life because it's a way of identifying. In their minds, they will be identified as undocumented. Are they putting themselves at risk and their family at risk? So again, understanding these, just these two components of a million components you have to understand about the culture um, would help the access and would help these individuals receive some access. I wanted to talk a little bit more about that in terms of um, you know, one of the statistics we've seen when it comes to pr providing and having access to mental health care in Texas is simply having enough providers to go around regardless of you know, what language they speak or where they're located. Pretty much the whole state faces a lack of mental health care providers. So maybe you could address the difficulty of finding someone who has the competency, ensuring that folks who come out of our schools are trained to have that competency to deal with it, our increasingly large immigrant community and its different facets. Well, we're certainly not keeping up, definitely. Um, we have a shortage at every level. We have a shortage of psychiatrists nationwide. We have a shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists. Um, we have a program here through the University of Texas for child residency, and we still have a shortage of child and adolescent residents for the city of San Antonio. Um, I, I work at, child, uh, at Clarity Child Guidance Center, 52-bed inpatient acute care for kids only, so uh, 17 and under, as well as outpatient. And our wait time for any child of any language right, is about three months to get in for an evaluation which is ridiculous. The, the, and, and usually parents of immigrant families seek mental health when it's an emergency. You don't have three months to wait, mm -hmm. right, as a parent. And of the 10 to 11 docs that we have, only three of us, right, which is a big group of, of Spanish speakers, um, speak Spanish. Right? And so cut down or expand the waiting time even more for the Spanish speakers. Um, so the problem is, is it's there, and it is very tangible. <laughs> Brandy, could I just add one quick thing? <laughs> just that, because Hog Foundation is very interested in the workforce issue, and as you pointed out, it's very deficient. And, the, and most of you, I'm sure, out in the audience are well aware of it. The closer you get to the Texas-Mexico border, the worse the numbers become mm -hmm. uh, in reference to. But it's not just... Uh, the, the, the specialist, but it's also child psychologist, uh, geriatric psychologist, uh, social workers, uh, psychiatric nurses, the list goes on and on. No, sorry, Ricardo. Yeah, no, just to add to that, I, I mean, I teach in the educational psychology department at UT. We have a, a, a doctoral program in counseling, a doctoral program in school psychology, as well as master's programs in counseling and school psychology. That's a lot of training and a very small percentage of those students are bilingual and are getting any kind of systematic exposure to working with immigrant populations, for example. In fact, there was somebody from Our Lady of the Lake here that has, uh, that university has sort of a model program for training people in, in bilingual education, uh, bilingual education, bilingual clinical skills and uh, cultural skills. Uh, but uh, 
I think our universities as a whole in Texas are really falling short in terms of preparing people for, you know, we've got 40% of the population in the state is, is Latino. And you've got, in terms of uh, the, the immigrant population, uh, 1.6 million people who are undocumented, as well as you know, several million more who, who, are, who are here uh, lawfully as immigrants. So you've got a, a, a large population whose needs are enormous. And kind of coming back to this issue of, of some of the challenges and the barriers, uh, I want to give you one example of, of, a, of a young man I spoke to recently, because I think it's important to, to sort of come back to, to seeing that we're talking about individual lives and not just sort of abstract numbers here. Uh, this is a young man who I saw uh, two months ago. He came from a, one of our Mexican border cities. He's 20 years old. He had been kidnapped at the age of 14 with two friends. His, he, uh, his family found the resources to, to get him released. His other two friends were executed. This kid uh, makes it across the border by himself. He gets to San Antonio and then eventually makes it to Austin. This is one example. Uh, there are many people. Quarter of a million people have fled to Juarez because of the violence in that city. People are leaving every one of these border communities because of what's going on. So when we're talking about immigrants and the mental health needs of immigrants, we're not only talking about people who are fleeing uh, their countries because of economic or uh, need or who are coming here to seek jobs. We're also talking a lot of people who are fleeing their communities because of the traumatic character of what's going on in those communities. And that, that needs to be sort of factored in when we start thinking about the mental health needs of these of this subset, especially when uh, I think the undocumented uh, uh, or unauthorized people have a, another layer of sort of distinctiveness. They've got their own set of issues in addition to the sort of the broader general issues of, of people who are immigrants who've left their communities, left their families, sometimes have left their children and are, are struggling with trying to find a way of, of uh, making a life for themselves here. And, continuing to support the families back home and so on. David, this might be a good place for you to jump in and share your expertise with us as a lawyer in dealing with folks who are trying to become legal residents and some of the obstacles they face in getting the health care that they need in, in terms of how that affects their ability to live here legally. Yes, thank you. Um, and at the Bernardo Kohler Center, we primarily deal with um, what I like to call victim services. So to give you some background on our agency, we deal primarily in, in four um, basic areas of the immigration law, which is um, asylum seekers, um, special immigrant juveniles who are uh, children who have been abused, abandoned, or neglected, um, trafficking victims who've been uh, trafficked for uh, sex trafficking or labor trafficking, and also uh, U visas, which are for victims of serious crime in the United States. So across that population that we deal with, it's um, almost unheard of that there's not some level of trauma or PTSD, some mental effect of everything that they've gone through just based on what we're um, providing services for at our agency. So we deal with this pretty consistently before the immigration courts and before the immigration service um, as far as dealing with our clients. Of course, the effects cause difficulties preparing their case. You have to try to work with them um, to ferret out the, the story and try to get them to be able to disclose that. And sometimes they need to be able to do that in front of an immigration judge in a court setting in some type of very traumatic environment to them. It's not your normal um, clinician type setting where there's a comfort level and a, an ability to do that. Um, and you have to present that then as credible to whatever source you're speaking with. So we utilize mental health experts fairly consistently to show the not only the effects of the trauma, but what it is, how that's going to affect their 
testimony, their written statement, their ability to recall events and recount mm -hmm. them before an immigration judge. Um, but there's still a couple of more aspects that I wanted to touch on, which was one when dealing with the access to mental health um, and factoring in the uh, poverty level and the, the legal status, say even when we obtain legal status, I just went through four basic categories. Um, Congress has, in its infinite wisdom, decided that um, certain immigrants, even if they're here legally, are, do not have access to public benefits. So even if there is access for low-income individuals to mental health services, many times the immigrant population is specifically prohibited from accessing those federal benefits. Um, so in kind of the scenario I gave you, um, trafficking victims and asylees can access them. However, crime victims and abused children cannot. So that's just written into the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, and then to take it a step further, um, I wanted to point out that in the immigration law, uh, if you're found to have a mental disorder, that can be actually a bar and a prohibition from obtaining legal status. And you would have to go through additional legal hurdles to try to prove um, that you're worthy of an exception. Uh, many times that's based on the effect to a relative that a U.S. citizen relative or a lawful permanent resident relative that these clients don't have. So I think from the legal perspective, um, many attorneys, many legal services providers actually discourage clients from seeking mental health services because it can have a detrimental effect on their legal cases. Um, just listening to that just, you know, starts upsetting me because I see some of the kids from the Office yes. of Refugee, right? And so here we are trying to provide care, trying to build trust in less than 60 minutes so that that person can then seek some, you know, some, some mental health care, support, we can diagnose. At the same time, they're always wondering, am I going to be sent back? I've tried coming over three times, and we were just discussing that just a little bit ago about you know, how many of these kids come over, they try and they try and they go through horrible situations, um, and yet to come here to look for a better life, um, a more trusting life, less violence, maybe even their family members that have left, and to come to that barrier and not be able to seek help. And, and again, it comes to the stigma. If they had diabetes, would we send these kids back or would we impair them from staying here? No, we wouldn't. If they're obese, no, we wouldn't. So why do we do it with mental health? There is a treatment, right? There isn't necessarily a cure, but there is a treatment. So why do we keep on using the stigma and we keep on just presenting it. And immigration, when that, that topic of immigration is not only non-documented, it's the US born kids are families of non-documented parents that have to live in this world of anxiety because you know, I can't go out and party because if I get caught, then my parents are gonna be called and maybe they'll get deported. And that's just a tiny example of what these kids go through. So it's a constant, you know, a constant stressor. Um, and they also don't seek mental health because maybe my parents are going to be identified. They ask for, we ask at our hospital, we ask for name, we ask for address. Just asking for identifying information can be a limitation. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Randy, uh, oh, you go ahead, Ricardo. I think we've got 40% of the children of undocumented people in Texas have U.S. born children. And that creates incredibly eviscerating situations where people who are in a position to treat children can treat some members of the family, can't treat other members of the family. It just these really insane uh, contradictions that we're faced with that are a function of, of, the, of the structure of the legal system and that, that guide the provision of services in the state. And it's, it's, it's really a tragedy. And I would like to add uh, also that uh, David brought up a good point, and so Ed kind of added on. But what we, what we unfortunately have created, if you think about it, is a system and an infrastructure that continues not only to stigmatize and, and, and actually enhance stigmatization, but actually, unfortunately, is also re-traumatizing. And uh, for those of you who are, or, are in tune with you know, trauma-informed care, it's totally not trauma-informed care at all. 
Uh, it doesn't even have the right uh, you know, facilities, especially in the detention centers. If an individual, unfortunately, does decompensate and becomes basically unable to represent themselves, they just languish there. I mean, I think David could probably speak to it better than I know I can, but there are multiple cases, there have been multiple you know, lawsuits brought forth because of that, because if you think of what's actually happening to these individuals, because we don't have to provide attorneys for them, individuals have to, in fact, come up with the attorneys themselves often. I know it's changing, but it's very, very slow, it's, it's glacier. Mm -hmm. But think about just, in, in general, the re-traumatization that's actually happening. When you take into consideration, as Ricardo was pointing out, the history that some of these folks have, especially starting with children and adolescents, and it just continues. Because the majority of, of immigrants that are here in Texas are rather young when you take a look at it compared to you know, US citizen uh, population. And so if we think about also the importance of how child and adolescents and the development phases, what is actually being done to these, to these kids and to these children, and the majority of them are overwhelmingly US citizens. I'm interested in talking about this topic of the, the young age of our immigrant population here and how looking forward at the demographics of our state as it changes, if we're not dealing with these issues and, and helping these young people find access to the care they need to address these mental health issues, um, how do we end this cycle of not having folks available to treat them in the future if we're not educating that current generation, if they're not able to get access to the care they need to you know, live successful lives? What does that say for our future as our immigrant population continues to grow? I'm happy for anyone to sort of jump in and Well, we, I think the numbers are like, I have an issue with numbers because since I'm in the front line, uh, my numbers are 100%. Once you're there, you're 100%. So, um, but, but I think the number is going to be like 30% of the immigrant population in 2050 is going to be Hispanic. And we talk about having access to mental health. It's not only about the access, because once you have your foot in the door, it doesn't guarantee that the, per, that, that the system is going to open the door for you. And mental health is a journey. So you can't just start by that first assessment. You have to be able to continue participating in different levels of the mental health, whether it's family therapy, whether it's identifying or continuing to help these individuals have some sense of mastery at school, which I think is a, is a big other topic of can undocumented kids continue in their school and college, and I think Texas is kind of has a positive attitude towards that. Um, but also, how do we supply physicians, for example? Um, there's different levels. It's not only, I mean, that would be a whole different topic of how to promote physicians, how to promote individuals to become physicians. But right now, we are just, inundated with obstacles for providing care. We want to provide care. The ones that say the child and adolescent physicians that are already there in the trenches. But then we have obstacles, for example, of insurances. Some insurances cover some kids, some insurances don't cover others. I feel like I, I, I know and I feel that I need to give this child the medication. I cannot because it's not on the formulary. So it's not gonna cost $20 copay, it's gonna cost 1,500. So there's a lot of, small mm. obstacles that all added together are also going to decrease access. If you are not a person that is educated in the system, you can't navigate through the system. You need someone to hold your hand and be able to teach you. Right? And that is, again, what we have to work on, especially for the immigrant families which are so fearful of even entering the system. If we want to stop the cycle, then we just have to stop the circle. We need to have it be a path, a straight path. But I think the key point that you're raising is uh, right on target, which is we have to invest in children. We have to intervene at the beginning. And the, the longer any kind of condition goes unresponded to, whether it's a social condition or a medical condition or psychological condition, the more complex it becomes, the more intransigent it becomes or intractable it becomes. And, and so, yes, we, we miss a, a, a tremendous opportunity when we don't intervene early on to provide services, education, uh, health benefits, all kinds of things that, that at the front end 
are much easier to do and very cost effective if you think about the long term costs of not providing those <coughs> services and then the, the kinds of issues that come from that absence. So I think it's, it's really important and, and it's partly a mindset. It's partly uh, a, a way that a society in, in our, our legislature, in our uh, local uh, politicians and so on, I mean, you know, making a commitment, having an understanding of what's involved and what the costs are if you don't respond. I would add, Brandy, that like the first panel sort of pointed out and the thing about the criminalization of mental health that has happened across not only Texas but the entire country. But in fact, uh, we're starting to see change as, as we, they talked about. But part of it is we're starting to, our advocates and organizations like Hogg Foundation and other great organizations in the state of Texas are helping to understand the interrelationship of all our different systems. Education, justice system, you know, the immigration system is one that's kind of been kind of left out because often it's seen more as federal, but it really affects the state of Texas because we have more detention centers, I think, than any other state, don't we, David? Yes. So if we don't understand that interrelationship, so I think that's also one of the pieces at a higher sort of policy level. If we start to bring those, those systems in relationships and how when we affect one system, the either known or even the unidentified consequences are the things we have to start thinking through. We've start, we're starting to do that here in the state of Texas, but I think this is an area that it hasn't quite happened to, mm -hmm. to yet because then some of the other issues that have been brought up can then really start to be addressed. I think you bring up what, what the place I wanted to go next, which is really talking about policy and some of this discussion we hear over and over again on the federal level, but inevitably doesn't get too far. And so, David, I was hoping maybe you could start talking a little bit about how these changes, what kind of changes you think we need to see in federal policies when it comes to immigration to help maybe reduce some of these barriers to access and, um, and start moving forward. Well, and first I would like to touch, if I may, on the detention issue because I know you mentioned change that's been occurring. And um, not so much in Texas. So there was a federal suit in California that was decided in uh, April of this year um, saying that immigrants in detention who had mental incompetency um, must have access to court-appointed counsel. Um, the same day that that happened, the federal court system, the immigration courts, put out a um, memorandum saying uh, what everyone thought was, oh, wonderful, they've seen the writing on the wall, they're going to be changing their policies, and they're implementing this nationwide. Um, and after reading it, it doesn't really do that. So there's not much of a change in Texas. As he mentioned, we have the most number of detainees of any state in the nation. Um, the current policy that they put out, which has not been implemented, even though we're in August, is that after they're detained for six months, and if there is a verifiable, documented mental health disorder, then they must have access to a representative, not a court-appointed representative. And so that's the current proposed state of affairs in Texas right now on the mental health detention side. These are people going through deportation proceedings that are likely going to be removed, sent back to their home country, who can't understand the proceedings that they're going through and can't competently represent themselves in the immigration court system. Um, but I think your point was we need to destigmatize, and I think that's the biggest policy change that needs to come into effect. Um, I kind of equate it to it used to be that having AIDS was a bar to immigration status, and they've been able to eliminate that um, because of the destigmatization of that, the fear of that contagion. And in some ways, it seems that mental health is looked at as contagious, or it's going to have some detrimental effect on society. And we need to get past that and look at, like you said, treatment options and how to keep that from becoming a problem and remove that fear in the immigrant community but in the community at large about people with mental illness. And if they get treatment, then that's the first positive step. I'm going forward looking at state policy issues is there anything, mostly in the Texas legislature, we hear a lot about documented versus undocumented and, um, and keeping, making sure that people aren't here illegally and um, those kinds of 
issues. It's more of a black and white kind of issue at the legislature when it comes to immigration. What can we do on the state level from your perspectives to start um, increasing access and addressing these issues um, on the ground? I think one obvious uh, thing that needs to be done is that uh, our legislators need to be educated about the role that Im immigrants are playing in our state. 9% of our workforce is an immigrant workforce, and a lot of those people are un undocumented. That says something about the relationship between our economy and this process of immigration, documented and undocumented. It's their responsibility to help that linkage work. And right now, uh, they're, they're sort of washing their hands of it and, uh, in the rhetoric of they don't, they're, they're not here legally, they don't have any rights, they should be dealt with uh, in, in these sort of harsh terms. And that's really not recognizing the way in which they are interwoven into our communities and our, our, our state at every level. And so I, I think that's, that's a, a key uh, shift in the mindset of who these people are, what role they're playing in our communities and why it's vital that we engage them and not just try to, to write them off because they don't have documents. One of the questions I think we had discussed earlier or last week when you spoke on the phone was um, the ACA and how, if at all, that would affect, if Texas were to accept that funding, would, accept, uh, would affect the ability for immigrants to access care and how that might affect different immigrants in different ways. So maybe you could talk a little bit about whether or not that's something that would um, help to overcome some of these access barriers. Brandon, that's a good point. Uh, obviously, we're not uh, too thrilled here in the state of Texas to want to do the Medicaid expansion. The Medicaid would be one, one, one venue that would be viable. But as you're pointing out, it wouldn't be obviously equally uh, providing access or even insurance for all the undocumented. Undocumented have never been able to access Medicaid or TANF or any of the federal you know, uh, benefits out there, and they wouldn't even after the ACA, even in states that are expanding it, that do have undocumented. But we have to remember in this country, we're talking about almost 22 million individuals that are in the immigrant status. So half are here legally. They would then be able to, depending on the state and how they want to roll out Medicaid, be able to have access. So, and with the undocumented, if we think about those mixed families like the Dr. Mickelson was talking about, those are U.S. citizen children. However, they do, they do would be able to benefit for the access. And in fact, they're able to access, you know, we think about CHIP and some of the other benefits uh, that exist out there that uh, the state and the federal government partner with and can be able to deliver to those populations. But because of the stigma and because of the fear, we're, we're, they're not even able to receive services that they, they qualify for. So I think those are areas that the state of Texas, that one, there has to be obviously immigration reform for the whole United States, but I think the Texas can think about, especially in the programs that they uh, have the, the most impact and influence in, on, to really have an overall comprehensive approach to it, as Ricardo's pointing out, because of the implications. And, and, as I, and it really goes back to me, if we understand then how different systems impact what's going on in, in, in the schools, what about our school-based programs, how could we ever, you know, how are we able to really in, you know, uh, impact and, and help to really bolster those up and make sure they have mental health services so that children that are in mixed families uh, or even are undocumented, thinking about and knowing about the consequences where this might be an individual who down the road really wants to become you know, uh, a citizen of the United States, contribute to the state of Texas, just like that young man who killed himself in South Texas, who in fact found out, well, it was posthumously, you got, a, you got accepted to, to UT Pan Am but that had to go with the, the DACA, you know, the uh, Deferred Action on Children, which unfortunately, you look at the ACA, are excluded from actually able to access services. Mm -hmm. So even for those uh, states that expand and accept ACA, they're completely legal under the, the current federal system, but they're, not, but they're excluded from all services. To me, that's rather illogical. I think the other thing we need to look at is, do our policies make logical sense? And that's a good example where I think it's affecting a very small group of individuals, but unfortunately, very negative fashion. On one hand, they're being told, 
We're here legally. We're going to try to help you to you know, stay in college and, or in high school, but we're not going to let you access any of the services so you can maintain being a healthy individual. And as we well know, health and economy go hand in hand. If, we, if Texas wants to stay viable and be an economic power like it has been and continue into the, 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 into the decade, as well as the United States to be on a global level, we need to be a healthy society. And so just undermining that, it really, to me, if you look at the chain, the, the, you know, the chains in a link, we're actually weakening one of them. And it's going to come back to roost if we're not careful. Mm. And if I can comment on that, that seems to be, from a federal perspective, the new trend. Allow, whenever there's some new immigration status or they allow a legalization, exclude from benefits. That seems to have happened pretty consistently since 2000. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I was saying, like, crime victims that passed in 2000, they're excluded from benefits. Mm -hmm. So they would not benefit from the ACA. And they're talking about this immigration reform proposal in Congress right now. They've also written in exclusion from benefits as part of that proposal. So that seems to be the new trend in Washington, is from a federal perspective, immigrants, even if you're legal, do not get access to benefits. I think the, it needs to switch to what is the cost then of not providing benefits. It's always coming down to a numbers game and what is the cost of being able to provide all of this to everyone. We need to look at what is the, the cost, both economically and in society, when we don't do that. And what are the consequences of doing that? And there could be some, uh, I love what David said, there could be some sort of logical solutions. I, I won't take credit for this, but the Commonwealth Fund just released a report just uh, within the last month in reference to immigrant status in the ACA. And why aren't we you know, thinking about you know, individuals who are here legally as immigrants mm -hmm. uh, and not being given benefits? Why aren't we offering the option for, say, binational insurance? Or even the t state of Texas would kind of make sense to me. For instance, if you're here, and uh, say you're here, if you're here, we have a green card or you're undocumented, but if you want to buy insurance, why don't we have policies which allow maybe a U.S. or Texas-Mexico policy? Hmm. You get your, maybe you get your catastrophic care in Mexico, but we'll still provide for primary care services here so you don't decompensate. And as I was saying, what about for the other chronic illnesses like diabetes and say you want to be, you know, uh, deal with uh, issues dealing with obesity? I mean, to me, that seems like a logical way to kind of look at that, but it doesn't even seem to be on, on the table. So I'm just saying, let's expand our focus. Let's look at the consequences, the pros and the cons, but come up with some solutions that could actually work. The individual still has to pay for the insurance policy. It's not like we're going to, the US taxpayer has to pony it up. But we're not even allowing that the option. The other thing the ACA doesn't allow uh, for, the, uh, for the undocumented is those states that are allowing the, the exchange to happen, they are barred from even purchasing from their own pocket insurance. Now, why, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would that be part of the policy? I, know, I understand that we shouldn't give them uh, any tax credits because they're one, they're not citizens, and two, they're undocumented. But why would you exclude them from even being able to purchase a policy? <laughs> That's the ACA today. So mm -hmm. to me, on one hand, it giveth, the other hand, taketh away. <laughs> it's rather illogical. So I want to go back to sort of what we talked about at the very beginning, which was that there, you don't often hear a conversation in which these two issues intersect mental health and immigration. And I'd like each of you to sort of talk about why you think that conversation isn't one that we have and, and what we can do to sort of move, move it into more of a topic of public discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm really not sure why uh, they don't, they aren't, it isn't a conversation we have more, more typically. I think it, one reason though, it, may be that we are so focused on, on immigrants as, a, as an economic, economically driven condition. People uh, who, who come, especially undocumented people, who come for economic reasons and they're playing some kind of an economic role in our society. And so that's the frame that we use to understand them. And, and I think that frame, um, excludes the, the more subjective human element about actually, but, but who are these people? And, and so it's nice that we can have, um, I don't know, a, a, a friend who recently remodeled his house, every crew was from Mexico. The sheet rockers, the painters, the electrical people, everyone. So he got perhaps a certain benefit, less expensive than he might have had if it was an all uh, 
American crew, perhaps. I don't know. But so, so that's the frame that people are, are using to, to evaluate the status of the immigrant in our communities. But they're not stopping to think about who these people are and, and what it means psychologically to have come across that border, the, the peril. I mean, if you're in Mexico every single day, there is coverage of what's going on on the border. Every single day, the, you know, if somebody's died, it's on the national news, it's, it's carried in the newspapers. There is, there is a, an awareness that crossing that border is a life-threatening enterprise. We completely, it's, it's, but in, and I think it's important because it, it has to do with how people in Mexico are viewing the immigrant as opposed to how we tend to view the immigrant, which is, again, very pragmatic. Are you taking a job from somebody else? Are you tapping our services that, that our taxpayers are, are paying for? I mean, th this is the language around which we talk about the immigrant, not as people who have complex lives like everybody else. And when you open into that terrain, then you have to start thinking about them in terms of mental health services, mental health needs, the, the kinds of complexities that come into families, et cetera. Dr. Mitchelson, would, do you agree as a matter of sort of humanization of <clears throat> the immigrant that you would perhaps find problematic? Yes, I do. I think that the word immigration or immigrant has some negative connotation to it sometimes. Um, as if I and being my territory or my home is being violated because someone is coming in by force. When actually, I think, and, and not bringing anything with them, right? When they are, again, we go back to our US born kids. A lot of these kids come from families um, that are non documented, and actually, mental health problems increase once you're here in the US. The level of depression and the rate of depression is le less in Mexico than it is here. So what, when we study these kids, it's being living here has an element of mental health negativity for these children. Right? But I, again, I think going back to the word immigration, we have to stop with also that stigma of, I'm an immigrant. right? I, I wasn't born here in the States. Um, but... We, we kind of see it as a negative thing when also you come, it's not only about the non-documented, it's about how many of these documented immigrants come over with money, right, with very high education individuals that are actually contributing to the society as well. They are also very limited from uh, accessing mental health because of the stigma, because of the language barrier, and again, because of the deficit in, in the number of physicians and social workers and you know, culturally competent um, health care providers. 